Hi, this is the Getting Started with Content Registration webinar. Um, this webinar will give an overview of our content registration process and is targeted towards members who are new to Crossref or existing members who want to learn more about getting your metadata into our systems. When your content is registered with Crossref, um, you can send us a range of information about the content, but not the content itself. We also enable persistent linking through identifiers. I'll go over what content you can register, what metadata you should send us, how DOIs fit into the picture, and the process of crafting content registration files and sending them to us. So what content can you register? We split content into several defined content types. You can currently register journal and journal articles, books and book chapters, conference proceedings and papers, reports and working papers, dissertations, standards, posted content, um, which essentially means preprints, data sets, um, supplemental materials, um, and we are going to be launching a new content type peer review reports um, very soon, within the next few days. You can send us other types of content that don't fit into these categories. Um, what we'll do with that is we'll collect some basic metadata, usually as a data set uh, content type, and we're hoping to provide more robust support for more content types in the future. Um, so if you see something if you have something that you want to register with us and you don't see it listed here, please get in touch with us and we'll see what we can do for you. So when you register your content, you must send us basic citation metadata for every item you register. This includes titles, authors, publication dates, issue numbers, ISSNs, anything that describes the content you're registering. We have minimal requirements because we need to support a range of publication practices. But we'll ask that you send us as much metadata as possible and that it be accurate and clean. The more robust your metadata is, the more likely your DOIs will be discovered and disseminated. We also collect non-bibliographic data about the items being registered. This can be as useful as the bibliographic metadata. We collect reference lists so that members can see what other members are citing their content. Um, we collect funding data to connect research outputs to funding. We collect ORCIDs, text and data mining license data, clinical trial information, information about errata, retractions, updates, and more through our Crossmark service. Uh, you can send us abstracts. You can send us information about relationships between items. So this is a um, preprint of this item this is a data set for this item and we're always looking into what else there is to collect that is of use to our community. When you register your content with Crossref, you are also registering a persistent identifier. Crossref uses DOIs, digital object identifiers, for every metadata record registered with us. When you submit your content, we register the DOIs you've included, and you and everyone else can then build persistent links to the item, ensuring that the links stay viable wherever the content moves online. A DOI has a prefix and a suffix. We assign the prefix to you when you become a member. You come up with a suffix pattern. When your DOI is registered, it becomes a link when the DOI registry URL, that's the doi.org prefix, is added to the front of the DOI. Over time, if your content moves, you can then update the URL registered for the identifier, and the identifier-based URL will continue to resolve. Our identifiers can and do change hands, so if your content moves to a different platform or content moves to your platform, you can update the existing identifiers to ensure persistence. We get a lot of questions from new members about creating a suffix for your DOIs. A DOI is an opaque identifier, meaning the DOI itself doesn't necessarily have any meaning, so there isn't a prescribed formula you need to follow. Here's what you do need to know. Our best advice is that your DOI suffixes should be consistent, simple, and short. They should be consistent for your sake. You should establish a pattern or suffix generation process that's easy to maintain. 
They should be simple for the same reason, and you want them to be short so that they don't take up endless amounts of space when used in citations. Again, a DOI suffix doesn't need to state anything about the item it is identifying. That's all done within the metadata you register with us. I'm now going to go into more detail about registering your content. The basics are simple. You create Crossref XML, either through systems on your end or some tools on our end. You send the XML to us, we process it, and you or your systems verify that everything's registered. So to create XML, um, we have our own metadata schema for deposits. And a schema, if you don't know, is a set of rules defining what can be included and in, in, in what format. Um, our schema is fairly rigid but comprehensive. So you can usually um, find a way to get whatever data you need to get to us using our schema. Uh, we update our metadata scheme regularly to accommodate the evolution of our services, and we rarely do anything that isn't backwards compatible. Our most recent schema version is 4.4.0, but we accept deposits with uh, 4.3.0 to 4.4.0. Uh, we'll soon release 4.4.1 when peer reviews are launched. Um, so we do have this metadata schema that can be used to deposit everything. We also have what we we call a resource schema that can be used to update or add selected piece of met metadata for your registered content. The initial XML you create for content registration must include metadata, metadata and identifiers. Our deposit schema enforces a rigid structure and our elements need to appear in a defined order. So here's an exa example. Um, every XML file that you send to us has some member-specific information in the head section. Note the email address. It's used to send out logs when your file has been processed. We also include metadata in the file. Here's a basic journal article deposit as an example. It contains journal metadata, such as title and ISSN, and issue and volume information, like volume, issue, dates. Um, you can also assign an identifier to a journal as a whole or a specific journal issue if you'd like. Um, a journal article has basic metadata like article title, author name, publication date, pages, and of course a DOI and a URL. The metadata collected for content types will differ, but you'll be able to supply a title, contributor, and publication date for all of them. Everything is sent to us as XML. Um, you can send us uh, your reference list for journal articles you register or books you register with us. And this is a sample of a citation deposit. Um, your citations can be marked up uh, into different fields. That's the most accurate way of sending us uh, data. By accurate, I mean that will collect the most data and allow us to make a match that data to a metadata record in our system. But you can also send us unstructured citations, and we encourage you to do this if you aren't able to mark, mark up your citations. Um, we will do our best to work with them and find a DOI match for them, and we're off, very often successful, particularly with journal article citations. If you are not able to generate Crossref Ready XML, we do have a few alternatives. We have a manual entry form. Uh, we call it the web deposit form, and this form, it's pretty basic. You enter your data field by field, and it writes and submits XML to us for processing. Um, it's kind of near the end of its lifespan. Uh, we're going to be rolling out a improved deposit tool um, very soon. We'll be able to auto-populate fields and add some features like saving and editing deposits that are missing from the current form. Um, and as, as I said, the, um, we're going to be releasing a beta version of that very soon, probably within the next few weeks. If you have a system that produces JETS or an NLM XML, we've written an XSLT transformation for that. Um, you can also upload JETS and NLM formatted, formatted files article by article using our web form. And if you want to expand your existing metadata records by adding license and funding information or adding references to something that's already been registered with us, um, 
we have a, a number of paths for that, for license and funding information and for as crawled URLs that you would use with our similarity check service, you can upload that type of data using CSV files. And if you are on the OJS platform, uh, note that OJS will generate and send in Crossref metadata for you, depending on what version you use. Um, this is a preview of our new metadata manager tool. It's currently in a closed beta test, but um, as I said, we'll be open, opening it up to the public for testing soon. Um, the first release of this tool will be used for registering journal articles only, but we'll be adding in other content types over the next year. Uh, it is a manual entry tool like your current form, but it will allow you to save your work, edit past registrations, review past content registration attempts, and you can also save, create and save and retrieve your journal information as you see here when you begin entering your metadata. So you don't have to keep entering the same data over and over and over like you do with the current form. We hope this makes this sort of work a lot easier for those of you who aren't able to generate XML. Um, and this tool will also capture information that isn't captured in our web deposit form, such as free to read information for open access content, uh, information about relationships between items and funding data. Um, so if you're planning to register a large back batch of content, um, like if you're going to be adding back DOIs to back issues, um, you may want to hold off until this new tool is released as we feel it will be a lot easier on you. You must deposit metadata and identifiers when your content is initially registered, but you can include all other metadata in your initial registration as well. But some types of metadata can be added post-registration as you are able. These include adding references for a cited by service, uh, funding data components, which are supplemental material metadata records. You can assign DOIs to supplemental material if you'd like in figures and tables. Um, Crossmark data can be added after um, your content has been initially registered, text and data mining license information. And you can also add information about how your records relate to other metadata records. So if you've created your file, now you need to get it to us. Uh, most registrations are sent to us by HTTPS post. If you have any sort of automated system, you will be doing that. We do have an interface for manually uploading files one by one. And I mentioned the web deposit form earlier that submits files generated by that form for you. We have a new RESTful API in the works that will allow you to submit your XML to us. If you're interested in helping us test this out, please uh, send support at crossref.org an email and we'll send you the details. Uh, this API isn't into, in production yet, so the usual caveats for that sort of thing apply. We can't guarantee it will be up and available, and we may be making changes to it until it matures into a production service. We're using this API to send data to our system for our, our new metadata manager tool. So it will be fully available soon. So when you do send us your content registration files, um, they're added to a submission queue. Most files are processed within seconds, if not minutes, um, sometimes minutes, uh, but we can get bogged down if traffic high is high. If you submitted something and don't see it, a submission log from us, you can always check to see if your deposit is still in the queue. If your deposit is processed successfully, great, you're done. Your metadata record is in our big database and you can start linking persistently. If your deposit fails, you'll need to review your logs and correct whatever issues exist. We generate a log for every file sent to our system. We send these logs out by email. You can also pull us for the logs if you have a system that can support that. The logs are in XML, so they're machine readable and somewhat personal, person readable, um, depending on, on how comfortable you are with that sort of thing. Here's an example of a submission log. The important part is at the bottom. The batch data section is a summary of your log results. If the record count and success count match, you're done. Everything was processed successfully. If there are any failures, um, they're flagged in failure count. You'll need to go through the log, find those error messages, and address them. A failure does mean that your record was not added to our system. We do have warnings. That means that your record was added, and the identifiers are registered, so your DOIs are available for linking. 
but um, there's probably something within your submission that needs some extra attention, so you could, should take a look at whatever warnings we send you. Um, so as far as submission failures, there are some odd errors that might come up, but most fall into three categories. Um, your XML is not valid. We only accept XML that parses. Um, so if it does not parse, your entire submission is rejected outright. Um, we do have some validation on our system side. Um, we do um, try to keep as much validation as possible in our metadata schema so that you can pre-validate. But um, some things aren't possible. Um, so we make sure that ISSN and ISBN are valid. They have um, checked data digits. Um, so if you submit an invalid ISSN and, or ISSN ISBN to us, your submission will be rejected. Your file might fail because of an issue with your title. Um, we do try to make sure that the titles you submit to us are consistent. There may also be permission issues. Journal titles change hands quite often. So if, if you've added or sold a title, please make sure we know about it so that we can make the appropriate ownership changes on our end. We do have one major type of warning. If the metadata in your record matches something that's already in our system, we'll put what we call a conflict warning in your log um, that just notifies you that you're duplicating something. Um, sometimes these aren't problems, but most of the time, if something's flagged as a conflict, it means either that you've duplicated something or you're not sending us enough metadata to conclusively identify something. So when your content is registered with us, um, a lot happens. Uh, we have your metadata, we send it out through a variety of sources. Uh, we send the, it to libraries, indexing services, researchers, educational tools, discovery services, and more. Um, your metadata is available through many channels instantly. Um, and in particular, our, our REST API is a public interface, so we often don't know who's, who's getting your metadata. It, it really, you can find it everywhere. Um, when you register your content with Crossref, as you know, um, we also register your DOI and URL with the DOI resolver. So your identifiers will be ready for linking immediately. And we also require our members to link from the reference lists using Crossref identifiers. So when your content is registered, <coughs> excuse me, our members will be able to discover those identifiers and use them to link directly to you. So if you have more questions, we have lots of documentation in our support center at support.crossref.org. Um, we have a small but very capable support staff. So please reach out to us at support at crossref.org if you have any questions. And we will be sending out the slides and rec webinar recording when we're done. And I've uh, collated a list of the, re the support articles and other resources that we've discussed um, at the end of the slideshow. Thank you.